When I was young, I did eagerly visit philosophers and saints and heard great arguments about this and that. But every time I came out the same door I went in. Leviticus 18, King James Version. Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, where ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover she is thy mother thou shalt not uncover her nakedness the nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover it is thy father's nakedness the nakedness of thy sister 
the daughter of thy father or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. The nakedness of thy son's daughter or of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. She is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. Neither shalt thou take a wife to sister, to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. Also, thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. and the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation nor any stranger that sojourneth with you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. That the land spew not you out also when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you? For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them, shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not 
yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. As quoted numerous times before, sexual selection plays the most impactful role in the evolutionary progression of modern humans. Leviticus chapter 18 highlights the sexual restrictions that were ordained. Of these restrictions and limitations, sexual relations between anyone within a certain degree of kinship was strictly prohibited. So when did this first begin? Undoubtedly before the flood, such abominations had already taken place. One could reasonably assume because we know the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the fish of the sea had already been intermingled amongst one another. But what about after the flood? We are told that Ham, the son of Noah, uncovered his father's nakedness. For generations, the words we read in a literal sense describe something far different than the actual truth. Even the most prominent biblical scholars promote the idea that uncovering your father's nakedness, as referred to in Genesis, simply indicates the narrative that Noah got drunk and lay naked while Ham mocked him as his brothers took a blanket and walked backwards toward their fathers. But when we read between the lines, the story goes much deeper. Without fully grasping the contextual meaning of the story, a non-inspired reader is led to an absurd conclusion. They ignorantly visualize Noah laying drunk and naked while Shem and Japheth walk backwards to cover him. But is this really what happened? Or is the truth being hidden in context. When Ham uncovered his father's nakedness, the punishment for such an act led to a curse. But instead of cursing Ham, Canaan was cursed instead. But who was Canaan? Canaan was the son of Ham. There is an entire sequence of events and drama that unfolds in Genesis that over 99% of all readers will miss that is not being told in the text. Even after discovering in Leviticus 20 that uncovering your father's nakedness actually means to sleep with your father's wife, what is really happening here? Who is your father's wife? As in most cases, during the times of ancient and continuing until present day, a man's father's wife is his mother. So a logical question should be asked. Did Ham sleep with his own mother? How many wives did Noah have? According to a breakdown of Genesis and corresponding apocryphal material, the wife or wives of Noah aren't recognized in any canonized text. Just as with other sources in biblical literature, the consensus is that Noah took only one wife 
to father his children. Why would the wife of Noah be missing from Canaanized text? Especially when women like Sarai, Hagar, Leah, and Rachel are mentioned as wives among the sub-patriarchs. In all truthfulness, Noah's wife should be considered some sort of grand matriarchal status, yet her name is not mentioned in Genesis. Since we can't locate her name in Genesis, this lack of evidence leads us to apocryphal text, especially the books of Jubilees and Jasher. The books of Jubilees and Jasher will lead to areas of contention when it comes to the name of Noah's wife. According to Jubilees chapter 4, the name of Noah's wife was Emzara. However, in the book of Jasher chapter 5, the name of Noah's wife is Nama. Why would these texts have different names for the wife of Noah? To complicate matters even further, Islamic historian George Sills wrote in his 1734 commentary, Noah's wife's name was Walia, who was an infidel woman who died in the flood. When we analyze both Jubilees chapter 4 and Jasher chapter 5, we see that in Jubilees, the births of Shem, Ham, and Japheth are listed out of order in a somewhat confusing manner. Jubilees chapter 4 verse 33 states and in the third year thereof she bore him Shem in the fifth year thereof she bore him Ham and in the first year in the sixth week she bore him Japheth the birth of Japheth is listed after the birth of Ham it clearly states after the fact that Japheth was born in the sixth week of the first year, which means Japheth was born beforehand. When we analyze Jasher chapter five, verse 16 states, Noah was 498 years old at the birth of Shem. Then moving to verse 17, it states, Nama conceived again and bore a son and called his name Japheth. And in verse 18, it states, Noah was 502 years old when Ham was born. The question that is not being answered in the text is, when exactly was Japheth born? In Jasher, Japheth is born immediately after Shem, and his birth date is not mentioned as a separate year of Noah's life. And in Jubilees, the birth dates of Shem and Japheth are listed one week apart. Shem was born in the first year in the fifth week, and Japheth was born on the first year in the sixth week. How is it possible that Nama could conceive two children a week apart? In the book of Jubilees, chronology has been broken up into segments of seven years and seven times seven years equaling 49 years with the 50th year being commemorated as holy. These 49 years in between the holy year equal one jubilee. So could it be somewhat possible 
that the time between the fifth and sixth week could have been long enough to conceive two children? Nonetheless, the closeness of the birth dates between Shem and Japheth leave us asking more questions than we have answers to. Is it possible that Shem and Japheth could have been twins? Again in Jasher, it states that Japheth was born right after Shem, yet there is no date differentiating the time between births, only the sequential order of Shem being born first and Japheth being born second. And this brings us back to the youngest son, Ham, who committed an act of abomination against Imzara or Nama. So although most biblical scholars will say Noah was simply naked and drunk, and Ham mocked him, in reality, Ham raped his own mother while his father was defenseless to stop him, and then afterwards, mocked him. This is what led Noah to curse Canaan instead of Ham because Canaan was the fruit of an adulterous abomination and Canaan was a product of incest. So at the genetic root of a Canaanite is an incestuous relationship, which means the first Canaanites were a clan of inbreeds. What are the most common results of inbreeding? One of the most physically apparent results of incest is albinism. This theory has been proven in several areas throughout the world, most notably in populations among small, isolated groups who are geographically separated from other groups. from the Missouri Department of Conservation, quote, inbreeding among small isolated populations or among closely related individuals can increase the chances for albinism. Even among humans, albinism rates vary with geographic location, end quote. Other ramifications to the offspring as a result of incest include but are not limited to infertility, dwarfism, facial asymmetry, clubbed foot, elongated skull, microcephaly, hemophilia, cleft palates, fused limbs. Taking this information and compiling what we have learned from previous episodes, we can ascertain from proven examples of geographic selection that in order for a race of people with a particular set of mutated genes to survive, they will have to interbreed with a genetically viable 
counterpart of a similar species. Quote, due to the chromosomal variation of DNA, the inbred is genetically different than a normal human. End quote. This would be the initial process of creating a human hybrid species. One inbred person and a human-like species capable of reproduction. In instances when this inbred person breeds with a genetically viable family member from the same gene pool, the chances of reproduction are much lower than if the inbred hybrid were to breed outside of his or her immediate gene pool, which means that this gene pool must breed with a genetically viable human or its lineage will go extinct. Many Muslims have speculated that this geographic isolation and mutation happened on the Greek island of Patmos by a scientist named Yakut. Quote, the Yaqub story originated from the writings of Wallace Fard Muhammad, the founder of the Nation of Islam. It was later developed by his successor, Elijah Muhammad, in several writings, most fully in a chapter entitled The Making of the Devil in his book, Message to the Black Man in America. Quote, from the message to the black man by Elijah Muhammad. Our 66 trillion years from the moon has proven a great and wise show of the original power to build wonders in the heavens and the earth. 6,000 years ago, or to be more exact, 6,600 years ago, as Allah has taught me, our nation gave birth to another God whose name was Yaqub. He started studying the life germ of man to try to make a new creation to whom our 24 scientists had foretold 8,400 years before the birth of Mr. Yakub, and the scientists were aware of his birth and work before he was born, as they are today of the intentions or ideas of the present world. According to the word of Allah to me, AMR, Yakub was seen by 23 scientists of the black nation over 15,000 years ago. They predicted that in the year 8400, that was in our calendar, before this world of the white race, this man Yaqub would be born 23 miles from the present holy city, Mecca, Arabia. And that when this man was born, he will change the civilization of the world and produce a new race of people who would rule the original black nation for 6,000 years, from the 9,000th year to the 15,000th year. After that time, the original black man would give birth to one whose wisdom, knowledge, and power would be infinite, one whom the world would recognize as being the greatest and mightiest God since the creation of the universe, and that he would destroy Yaqub's world and restore the original nation or ancient nation into power and rule forever. This mighty one is known under many names. He has no equal. There never was one like him. He is referred to in the Bible as God Almighty and in some places as Jehovah, the God of gods and the Lord of lords. The Holy Quran refers to him as Allah, the one God beside him. Skipping ahead in the same chapter, quote, 
Yakub's made devils were driven out of paradise into the hills of West Asia and stripped of everything but the language. They walked across that hot, sandy desert into the land where long years of both trouble and joy awaited them. But they finally made it. Not all. Many died in the desert. Once there, they were roped in to keep them out of paradise to make sure the Muslims who lived along the borders of East and West Asia were ordered to patrol the border to keep Yakub's devils in West Asia, now called Europe, so that the original nation of black man could live in peace and the devils could be alone to themselves to do as they pleased as long as they didn't try crossing the east border. The soldiers patrolled the border armed with swords to prevent the devils from crossing. This went on for 2,000 years. After that time, Musa, Moses, was born, the man whom Allah would send to these exiled devils to bring them again into the light of civilization. Let us not lose sight of what and how they were made and the God who made them, Mr. Yakub. Since we have learned that Mr. Yakub was an original black man, the ignorant of our people may say, if Yakub was a black man and the father of devils, then he was a devil. That is like one saying the horse is as much a mule as the mule. This only tends to convey the idea that they were created from nothing, which means low and humble origin of such creation. Again, we learn who the Bible is referring to in the saying, let us make man. This us was 59,999 black men and women making or grafting them into the likeness or image of the original man. Now that they are the same, but have the ways of a human being, they are referred to as mankind, not the original man, but a being made like the original in the sense of human beings. Being without a guide, they walking on their hands and feet like animals learn to climb trees as well as any of the other animals. At night, they would climb up into the trees carrying large stones and clubs to fight the wild beasts that would come prowling around at night to keep them from eating their families. Their next and best weapons were the dogs. They tamed some of these dogs to live in the caves with their families to protect them from the wild beast. After the time, the dog held a high place among the family because of his fearlessness to attack the enemies of his master. Today, the dog is still loved by the white race and has given more justice than the so-called Negroes and is called the white man's best friend. This comes from the cave days. After 2,000 years of living as a savage, Allah raised up Moses to bring the white race again into civilization to take their place as rulers, as Yakub has intended for them. Musa, Moses, became their leader. He brought them out of the caves and taught them to believe in Allah, taught them to wear clothes, how to cook their food, how to season it with salt, what beef they should kill and eat, and how to use fire for their service. Moses taught them against putting the female cow under burden. He established for them Friday as the day to eat fish and not eat meat on that day. And fish is the main menu on Fridays in many of the whites' homes today. They were so evil that Moses had to build a ring of fire around him at night and he would sleep in the center of the ring to keep the devils from harming him. They were afraid of fire and still are. Allah said that one day Moses told them he was going to have fish come up from the sea so that tomorrow we will have some fish. On the next day, the fish were there. Moses had a boat sent up from Egypt. Moses said, see, the sea came up last night and brought us some fish. One of the savages was a little smart, and he said to Moses, where is the water? From then on, Moses recognized the fact that he could not say just anything to them. He had a hard time trying to civilize them. 
Once they gave Moses so much trouble, he took a few sticks of dynamite, went up to the mountainside, placed them into a group, went back to get those who were giving him the most trouble. He said to them, stand there on the edge of this mountain and you will hear the voice of God. And they stood there, 300 in number. Moses set the fuse off and it killed all of them. End quote. God created them in his image. They are in the image and likeness of a human being, black man, but are altogether different kind of human being than that of the black human beings. Their pale white skin, their blue eyes, even disliked by themselves, tells any black man or woman that in those blue and green eyes, there just can't be any sincere love and friendship for them. They are unlike we are like. Like repels, unlike attracts. The very characteristics of black and white are so very different. Black people have a heart of gold, love and mercy. Such a heart nature did not give the white race. This is where the so-called Negroes are deceived in this devil race. They think they have some kind of heart, but the white race knows better. They have kept it a secret among themselves that they might be able to deceive the black people. They have been and still are successful in deceiving the black man under the disguise of being the ones who want peace, love, and friendship with the world and with God, at the same time making war with the world to destroy peace, love, and friendship of the black nation. A brother loves and desires for his brother what he desires for himself. So-called Negroes, do you have this kind of love and desire from the white race for you? Why? Because I have shown to you they are not your brothers by nature. They are fully showing you this day openly that they are different from you and you are different from them. Why not try making brotherly love and friendship with your own kind first? to see you are trying to integrate with the enemy of yours and God shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that you don't know yourself nor your enemies or rather are lost in love for our enemies. I know you who love your enemy don't like that I tell you this truth, but I can't help it come what may. God has put me upon this mission and I must do his will or burn. Are you with me to do the will of God or of the devil and the disbelieving people? I know you are, for you have learned and are learning more truth than you have ever read or ever will read. Fear not. Allah is on our side to give you and me the kingdom. End quote. From a message to the black man by Elijah Muhammad. questionable past of Fard Muhammad aside, is there any degree of truth that could be ascertained by the Yaqub doctrine? Now delving into the context of the inserts from the chapter Making the Devil, we can see that parallels have been liberally made by either Wallace Fard Muhammad or Elijah Muhammad concerning the biblical patriarch, Moses, and the civilization of savages. According to the text, 2,000 years ago, Allah raised up Musa, a.k.a. Moses, to bring again the white race into civilization.
Among several areas of contention was the account of Moses killing 300 savages with dynamite. Although Moses is widely considered one of the greatest biblical patriarchs, he is not credited with the invention of dynamite, nor were these accounts mentioned anywhere in Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Jasher, Jubilees, as well as any other literature considered apocryphal. So where did Elijah Muhammad get this story from? The general consensus is that Elijah Muhammad was taught this story by Wallace Fard Muhammad. But who was Wallace Fard Muhammad? In fact, that's the million dollar question. Even unto this day, the true identity of Wallace Fard Muhammad is still shrouded in mystery. However, one point is most certainly not a mystery. Fard Muhammad was a white man. According to the FBI, Fard Muhammad was born in New Zealand to a British father and a Polynesian mother and immigrated to the United States in 1913. It appears that the Yaqub story comes from the teachings of Fard Muhammad. So the logical question should be asked. How could Fard Muhammad legitimately promote the Yaqub doctrine while simultaneously acting as the founder and head of the nation of Islam? According to Fard, the white man was the devil, but he himself was also a white man. This would never work, but his influence had been made in a relatively short amount of time, and the nation split into two divisions. His followers either went into the Moorish science temple or remained in the nation of Islam. Beyond the obvious fact that many pseudo-biblical interpretations made by Muhammad do not fall in line with recognized scripture, he was recognized as a biblical scholar and a prophet. Even the most elementary understanding of the Bible would lead anyone with grade school comprehension skills to question certain fallacies. But if you target illiterate people who think Moses and Jesus belong in the same book, they will be too ignorant to recognize they are being lied to, therefore making them easy prey for manipulation. Fueling that manipulation was racism, corruption, and poverty, also making it easier to depict the white man as the devil. This information would have seemed more compelling coming from the devil himself in the silhouette of Fard Muhammad. Venturing off into other areas of biblical inconsistency, the parallel has been widely made that Yaqub is in fact Jacob, son of Isaac and grandson of biblical Abraham. Even Minister Louis Farrakhan ascribes to this theory. You said that the thing that 
causes us to be listed as a hate group is our teaching on Yakub. My question to you is, can you, with all of your scientists, disprove what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has said of you. You are not an ancient people. You are new people on our planet. You had to have a place of origin and you had to have a source from which you originated. You even put out a movie called Children of a Lesser God. And Yaqub was a god, all right, but he was a lesser god to the god who originated the heavens and the earth and all in between. You are a scientific experiment that we did with ourselves to see whether evil had the same power as good. So in the germ of the black man, the life germ, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that Yaqub saw the brown germ in the life germ of the black man, a black germ and a brown germ. And he said that if he could separate that brown germ, he could drive it into its last stage and clothe it with flesh and give it form and expression and that Mr. Yaqub did. Yaqub was born 20 miles outside of the city of Mecca in Arabia. Go to the book of Habakkuk. It says God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. These are two cities in Arabia. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad asked, which one of these two would you take for your Lord? The God that came out of Teman or the Holy One from Mount Paran? Arabia is the birthplace of Yaqub. It is where he taught the 30% who were dissatisfied to follow him but the rulers of Arabia would not allow him to make his people on that peninsula. So they assigned him to the island of Pilan or Patmos in the Aegean Sea. And there he took his followers and the process of grafting white out of black began. And the book says, the elder will serve the younger, and the stronger will serve the weaker. Here it comes now. Then Jacob, in a place called Peniel, wrestles with a man. And while he's wrestling with this man, his thigh is thrown out of place. And he wrestles all night till the breaking of day. And when the day came, he had prevailed. And he said, I have seen God face to face. And my life has been preserved. So the one that he wrestled with said, your name shall no longer be known as Jacob. Your name shall be known as Israel. Israel means the supplanter. The supplanter. When you supplant somebody, you take something that don't belong to you by devious, deceitful means. You are the original people, therefore you are the first. You are the elder. You are the stronger. But the people, they were fighting in the womb. Now I want you to hear this. Your role has been usurped. You are the original, the natural ruler. And you on the bottom. The Johnny come lately is on the top. Yes, 
He's the real Israel. Okay, now he, Jacob, or Israel is going to usurp the role of God and the role of the black man. One nation is the older. That's you. Yes, sir. You're going to serve the younger. One nation is stronger, but you're going to serve that which is weaker That's right. than yourself. That's right. And Je Esau comes in with the venison. And he, he said, Father, I bring you. He said, but, oh, my God. But I can't take my blessing back. I gave it to your brother. He said, but isn't there, isn't there some blessing left for me? He said, well, son, you're going to have to serve your brother. He said, but in the final analysis, the yoke of your brother will be broken. Even within the minister's strained attempt at biblical comprehension, in which he flounders absurdly, relying on the false teachings of charlatans to draw weak comparisons to scripture, he is totally missing one simple point that even further highlights his lack of knowledge on the subject. The chronology does not match. 6,000 years ago, under any recognized standard of dating, would have put the life of Yaqub, aka Jacob, before the flood, thus making him older than Noah. All shenanigans aside, there can be some truth discovered within the madness of this excessively imaginative rhetoric. It is within the realm of possibility that Wallace Fard Muhammad was an agent working for European intelligence. Considered a man of many aliases, it has been proven that he's used at least half a dozen. Could it be possible that this Patmos Island theory is true, but told through a web of lies and half-truths? One truth is apparent. This story is told through a lens of artificial selection, selective breeding, and geographic isolation. All tactics employed by Yakub, aka the big-headed scientist, were in a sense a product of Darwin, but without any hint of the monkey to man doctrine. According to the theory, over the course of 600 years, the original black man was turned into a white man through a process of grafting. This white man would soon begin to rule over the black man and the entire earth. But how plausible is this story? Quite plausible indeed. We know for a fact that genetically distinct populations can arise over generations due to geographic isolation, essentially creating a new race of people. Elijah Muhammad said it took 600 years. Quite assuredly, Farrakhan must know that it doesn't take 600 years to breed out black. Incest and albinism are some of the leading causes of melanin deficiency in physical characteristics such as skin color, eye color, and hair color. Yet none of these characteristics can guarantee blackness any more than they can guarantee non-blackness. If an albino child has two black parents, that child wouldn't be considered white. And if that very same child miraculously mated and procreated with another albino and their child was a third generation albino, is that child not black?
If there is any truth to this theory, I would parallel the creation of white people around 600 years ago instead of 6,000 years ago. Although white people most likely are slightly older than 600. Can any truth be deciphered from this story? We could parallel the creation of white people around 6,000 years ago and instead divide that by 10 and make it around 600 years ago. Ancient history, chronological history, and understanding of scripture and archeology span all seem to support the stance that there were no Caucasians found in any archaic strata to lead anyone to believe that they had been ruling or even existed for 6,000 years. Although 600 years would make more sense, the most significant archaic strata that resembles the DNA of Caucasians comes from Homo erectus and Australopithecus. Could there have been a point in time when 10th generation albinos could have degenerated into the form of apes? Or could the 10th generation of albino unions create what we know today? as Caucasians? What happened to the men who ascended to the top of the Tower of Babel and said, we shall serve our own gods? these questions and more on the next episode of the smartest beast in the field.